first on the list, we have um, Aaron Friedman, uh, who uh, just finished his Master's of Science in Computer Science in the field of computational geometry. And uh, he is a uh, Python developer uh, working at Fabric, formerly known as Common Sense Robotics, involved in system architecture and development. And he's going to be talking about boosting simulation performance with Python. So, uh, uh, Aran, thank you for uh, joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for the introduction. So where are you streaming from? Sorry? Where are you streaming from? Oh, OK. I'm streaming from Tel Aviv, Israel. Nice. Yeah. Excellent. How's the weather there? Uh, really hot. Really yeah, hot. It's cool. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Well, I will turn this over to you then. And uh, OK. Thank you very much. I'll show the screen. Okay, so hi again, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, you're probably here because you run any kind of simulation or integration test at your work. Um, now, how many of you would like to spend less time on waiting for them to finish and to have more time for coding or for solving bugs if you write some? So I'm glad you're here. Uh, today, you will see how you can use the discrete event simulation approach to simulate your system. And now, how, and how it will allow you to simulate hours of your system in minutes or even in seconds. So before I talk uh, about how we run our simulation, let me tell you what we do in Fabric and what we simulate. So before I show you the video, I need to switch the sharing mode. Okay. In Fabric, we build a fulfillment warehouse for online orders. Uh, most of the work is done by robots. We have two types of uh, robots. The first type is called leaf robot. You can see it now in the video. And the second type is called ground robot, which moves on the ground, on the floor. Uh, together, they cooperate and help us to fulfill the orders. Uh, it works like that, the lift robot takes totes from the shelving units, put, put the tote on the ground robot. The ground robot brings the tote into picking stations where the items are picked and later delivered to the customers. Just exit the mall. All right. So my name is Eran. I work at Fabric for about four years. Uh, now I mainly focus on the development of this cute robot, but before that I was involved in different areas in the system. One of them is the simulation infrastructure, which I will present to you today. We start by seeing uh, why simulations are so important. Um, then we'll see how to use the discrete event simulation approach and how to do it in Python. Uh, then I'll talk about some challenges we encountered and how we, we deal with them. And finally, how to distribute the multi-threaded simulation into a multi-process simulation. So first, what exactly we simulate? So usually the term simulation means a tool that imitates the behavior of a system. Now in our case, it is not exactly the case. Or let's take a look in this uh, very simplified draw of our system. We have the backend, which is, which is a pure software. It managed the activity of the system, it managed the orders from client, the stock, the motion of the robot, it sends commands to the robot and receives telemetry back from the robot. So in this simulation tool that I will talk about, we simulate only the robots. So we run the system, the backend just as it runs in production, but instead of communicating with the real robot, it communicates with virtual robots. This the decoupling of uh, software and hardware is extremely important today when we all work from home due to the coronavirus and the uh, access to the hardware is uh, very limited. Uh, this tool has several more usages. Uh, first, it is used as a testing tool when developers write new code, as long as the code doesn't run on the robot, then it is one of the options to test the code. It is also used as, our, uh, as part of our regression test in the continuous integration system. Also, in a complex system, it's difficult to know how 
new algorithm or optimization will affect the system, the KPIs of the system. So this is the place to, to evaluate it before running it in production. Uh, again, robots and the hardware is very limited and uh, very expensive. And this decoupling of software and hardware allows us to run as many simulations as we need on the cloud. We use this tool to evaluate a new warehouse before investing money in construction. We can run the system on a new layout and see what KPIs we can reach and how many robots are needed to reach this KPI, for example. In simulation, it is very easy to inject failures in the robots and by that to improve the reliability and the robustness of the system. We also have uh, an integration center in our offices and an integration lab in our offices where we can test the code with the real uh, robots, but it's not as big as the production warehouse. Uh, so simulation is the only place you can run it on a uh, big setups before running it in the production. Oh, we saw, we saw what we simulate and the, what you said we do with the simulation tool. Now let's talk about how we run the simulation. Or the approach we are using is called discrete event simulation. In this approach, continuous operations are modeled by instant events. For example, if we want to simulate an elevator, then the events can be a door is open, elevator arrived, button pressed, and so on. And the simulation also maintains uh, its own clock and it immediately moves from one event to the next event and that's how the time can run faster than the real time. In our simulation, we we do it a little bit different. We treat the time as the events, um, and in each, we divide the time into time ticks, and in each time tick, we calculate the new state of the robots. So we simulate the operations of the robot, which are move, turning, passing code from one robot to another robot. Let's take an example. Let's, let's see the move operation of a robot. Let's say that a robot can move in two meters per second and we choose to have 10 time ticks in a second. So at first the robot is located at uh, x0 and assuming it got a move uh, operation, then the next time tick will be 0 0.1 and the robot will calculate the new state, which is 20 centimeters. Then again, the next time tick will be in 0 0.2 and the robot will calculate the new location, which is 40 centimeters. And notice that uh, in this approach, the robot was never between 20 to 40 centimeters. It immediately moves from, from one set to the next. Uh, in the reality, the robot anyway sends telemetry to, to our backend a few times in a second. So the behavior looks the same for the backend. It is discrete anyway, and we don't lose any information by doing so. So this is the idea of uh, the discrete event simulation. Now to implement it in Python, we use the SymPy library. SymPy is an open source library. It is a framework for discrete event simulation. It is very simple and uh, well documented and there's a lot of uh, samples on the web. Uh, it is also lightweight. I mean that uh, it doesn't try to help you to simulate your components. It just gives you the framework to implement the discrete event simulation. Before we see how to do it in the code, let's see, let's understand the idea of SymPy. So to be, to understand SymPy, you need to be familiar with the three objects. The first one is environment, the second one is process, and the third one is the events. The environment is the main object that manages the whole simulation. It has the simulation clock and uh, it has an event queue. Process represents the component we want to simulate. So in this example, we have two processes, one for robot zero and one for uh, robot one. Now, at first, the processes adds the initial event in the queue. So we have two events, one for robot zero and one for robot one. And when we start the environment, it takes the first event from the queue, it runs it, so it calculates the new state of the robot. And before it is done, it adds the next event of that robot in the queue. And then again, it takes the first event from the queue, which now belongs to robot one. Again, calculates the new state, adds the next, the next state of robot one in the queue. And then again, it will take the next event from the queue, which this time, uh, which again belongs to robot zero, but this time it is in time 0 0.1. So 
so it will update the clock to 0 0.1. Uh, so this is the very basic idea of how SimPy works. Now let's see how to do it in the code. So in, in the code, we'll see a very simple example of using the, uh, the SimPy. And in this example, we'll conduct a race of robots. It's the, let's say that a robot can move somewhere between two to four meters. Okay, so let's go over the code and then we also will run it. So here we define that we have three robots in the, in the race. The race is going to last for 30 seconds and we choose to have two time ticks in a second. So we'll have a time tick after every half a second. Here we implement a very simple robot. We only implement the move operation. As you can see, it is a Python generator. So at first, all the locations of the robot is uh, zero. Each iteration of the while is a time tick. So, so it will calculate the new location to make it interesting and use the runtime function. Notice that uh, I provide the function one and two because we said that the robot moves between two to four meters and we have two time ticks in a second. So it is one to two per half a second. Then the robot will print the simulation time, the robot ID and the new location. And it will tell the environment that the next time it wants to run is in half a second. So here we initialize our environment. We register the simple process into the environment and run the environment. Let's now run the race. So I'm going to, to run the code. Remember that the race is, is about 30 seconds. And of course, it is not going to take 30 seconds. I use the time command, which will print the time it took the program to run. So as, as you can see, it, it uh, lasted uh, less than one second. Uh, so I saved each of you 20, about 29 seconds. Okay, so an important point to be aware of is that all the SimPy process, all the components we are simulating run in the same thread. As you could see, it is it's using a Python generator and the environment runs each event at a time. And I'll talk about it again in a few slides. Also the parameters that affect the runtime of the simulation are obviously the number of components. The more components we are simulating, then the more cal calculations we have to do, and therefore a slower simulation. And also the time to granularity. The, the bigger granularity, then again, more calculation in a second, and the slower simulation. Uh, the mode I, I described so far is called as fast as possible. It means that the simulation tries to run the fastest it can. It immediately moves from one event to the next event. Uh, SimPy also allows to run in a real-time mode where it tries to follow the real time. It will run an event and before moving to the next event, it will wait until the time of the next event will come. Now, why would we want to do this? I mean, in the first thought, you would think that we always want to run the fastest we can, but you may want uh, to do some manual testing in your uh, system, like a REST code, so whatever, or you also may want to combine real hardware with your simulation. So these are good reasons to run it in a real-time mode. Uh, deploying uh, the discrete event simulation approach has several benefits. The most obvious one is that it makes the development more efficient. When developer finish the right code and you test it, then you will get a faster feedback, and also you get a shorter CI. But as you can imagine from the previous slide, when I talked about parameters that affect the runtime, if we will run the simulation with many, many robots, then it may be that the simulation will even run slower than the real time. Uh, but this is still an advantage because that way, the result of the simulation, the KPI will still be realistic. It means, I mean that in every time tick, all the robot will get the chance to do the calculations, the, the, to calculate the new, the new state, and uh, that's how this, the time will not run too fast. Um, from the same reason, it is also deterministic. It doesn't matter if you run it on a strong uh, machine on the, uh, on the cloud or on your private laptop. The runtime of the simulation may be affected, but the result will be deterministic. And also it is agnostic to profiling and debugging. Still, you will get the same results. 
Uh, last, using this uh, approach will also allow you very easy to simulate any date or any time of the day. Like you can run the system like it is uh, the weekend or any special time that in is interesting for you. Uh, in SimPy, for example, you just need to provide the initial time to the environment and this is that simple. Uh, and then this bug wouldn't happen. If uh, we wouldn't be panicked before the Millennium bug if we had this approach. Okay, so far I showed you how to simulate robots using the discrete event simulation. But recall that at the beginning, I mentioned that we want to run our system, our backend together with the simulated uh, robots. So now our backend is a multi-threaded uh, system. It has several threads that uh, get messages and uh, react to them. The messages can be either telemetries from robots, input from the user, uh, orders from customer and such. Uh, can you think what is the problem of running the backend together with the robots? So the problem is that the robots may run the time too fast and the back the backend wouldn't have the time to do the work like it would do in the real time. Uh, SimPy has a support for event-driven uh, processes, but as I mentioned before, all the SimPy process run all the SimPy processes run in the in the single thread. So it will change the behavior of our backend. And we already had a similar experience when we use the Gvent monkey patch, which make your system, uh, your thread cooperative and runs the system like it is uh, one thread. It did improve the performance of the system, but later we found out that we have some bugs that we couldn't see in simulation. Uh, therefore, the solution of uh, SimPy for event-driven processes is uh, not good enough for us. So we came up with our own solution. Uh, in simulation, we create another SimPy process which in every time tick, it holds the time until the event-driven threads will do their work. It is doing it by calling the join on the threads queue. And the join function waits until the queue is, is getting empty. And that's how we make sure that the event-driven thread will have the time to handle the, the, the events. Let's see an example in the code. Okay, so in this example, we'll see, uh, we'll have uh, one event-driven thread, which listened to a queue, get a message and printed it to the screen. And another robot, which in every time tick will send a, telemet a message to the event-driven thread. So let's go over the code. Uh, this time we'll have a time tick, one time tick in every one second. For now, I'll just uh, show you the problem. So ignore this class, we'll see it later. So this is a simple implementation of an event-driven thread. What it is doing is listening to the queue, printing the message to the screen, and that's it. Here we implement another simple robot. In each iteration, it adds a message in the event-driven queue, and kills the counter, and tests the environment that will run again in one second. So again, we initialize the environment, this time, to see the problem, we use the regular Python queue. We start the event-driven thread. We register the environment and, and run it. So let's run it. So just remember, we are going to, we are going to run the simulation for 50 seconds. And in each second, the robot will send a message to the event-driven thread, which should print it to the screen. So I'll run it. And as you can see, we don't see any message in the screen. And this is exactly the problem that I described. The robot did send 50 messages, but the event-driven thread didn't have the time to, to handle them. So let's see how we solve it. We, we know it from the Python queue. And in simulation, we had another SimPy process that in each time tick, it will call the join on the queue. And then we will again tell the environment that will run again in one second in the next time tick. So let's use this queue this time. Okay. Open it well. So let's run the example again, this time with our queue. And as you can see, it solved the problem. The, the, usage, the usage of the join helps the event driven thread to handle the messages. 
Uh, so as you could, you could see in the example, the, the event-driven thread is not really aware of SymPy. And that's what I meant that we run our, product, our backend in simulation just as it runs in uh, production. It doesn't wear aware whether it is a production or a simulation. Uh, with the extension that the uh, backend cannot call the default uh, time functionality because in simulation they are not relevant, right? We have a different clock. So we wrapped all that functionality in our own module and the backend just calls this module. And this module knows whether it is simulation or production and calls the, the right functions. Uh, last, we, in simulation we print the the simulation timestamps in the log because when you are debugging uh, the simulation, you care more about the simulation time. Now, eventually, we also uh, moved to microservices, just like just like uh, everyone else, uh, and we again we wanted the, the simulation to we wanted our system to run the simulation just like it runs in uh, production. So it means that this time we don't use a multi-threaded simulation, but we want a distributed simulation. We said that SimPy doesn't support a multi-threaded simulation, for, so for sure it doesn't support multi-process simulation. So we came up with a, that solution. In a simulation, we run another service called Barrier Server, and the responsibility of this service is to sync the time of the other services, to prevent one service to run faster than the other services. So all the other services look uh, the same as I described so far, the same as the multi-threaded simulation. Each one of them has its own uh, local SymPy, and all of them pick a shared time tick, and it works like that. At the beginning, they initialize the uh, SymPy, they do, each service is doing his work, and once the shared time tick arrives, they send the ready message to the barrier service. The barrier service holds that message and, uh, until gets the message from all the other services. And uh, once he got them, he send them the approval and then they can move to the next time tick. That's how we prevent one service to run faster from the other services. Notice that since the service sends the ready message to the barrier server until he gets the approval, the time holds for him. He waits for the other services to reach the next time too. Um, so I finished the slides. I think we have a few minutes uh, for questions and then I just sum up the talk. Awesome, thank you very much. Okay. So I do have a couple of, uh, well actually I have, I have one question so far. If anyone has any questions, um, please post it in the Q&A here on uh, Zoom or you can uh, also uh, post it in the um, Parrot Track uh, chat room over on Discord, which I'm keeping an eye on as well. Uh, anyway, so uh, Ruth Vanderham asks, uh, are you familiar with the other Python DES called Salabim? Yeah, I heard about it. I think it is quite new, maybe 2017. So before we started, it wasn't exist. Uh, but anyway, I, I checked it. And it looks pretty, pretty similar to Simpa. I think it also uses uh, generators. Um, and it has also the notion of environment, I think. But anyway, I didn't uh, really try to already use the SymPy, and, uh, and I also didn't see much comparisons with them. So if, if someone here is not aware of it, is uh, familiar with it, I'd like to hear in the Discord system. I uh, also have another question, actually also from uh, Ruth Vanderham. He says, yeah. how does the messing, messaging between the barrier service work? So this is a depends on your implementation, depends how your services uh, communicate. In our case, we use a message queue for this. So, you, but you can do it with the rest or sockets or any other messaging. All right, excellent. Um, so it looks like. Um, so that's all I have at the moment. Um, okay. So once again, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if anyone uh, wants to chat with um, Aran um, afterwards, he is, um, you can look up uh, his room, uh, which I believe is uh, boosting uh, sim performance in um, uh, Discord. 
And uh, Aaron, you said you wanted to do a quick recap? Yeah, of course, thank you. So yeah, so what we saw in the talk, we saw just how important uh, the simulation is, especially for an hardware company like ours. Uh, and the discrete event simulation has some more benefits with it. Uh, again, if you want to do it in SimPy, uh, in Python, you can do it in SimPy. Also, there is the Arbin uh, module library. Uh, if you want to run the simulation with your system, then you may suffer a time leak. You just need to make sure that all the components are tied to the time somehow, to the clock. And then finally, the, the extension of the simulation into a distributed simulation was really straightforward for us. And, really took us a couple of days to do it. So that's it. Thank you very much for uh, listening. Hope you enjoyed.